Uh, Jin, speaking of scenic, um, would you, because your shrine's a pretty beautiful, I've seen your shrine and it's not necessarily exactly like the one behind you at the moment, but it's a almost perfect embodiment of the balance and the sort of um, wealth of faith you've just spoken to. Do you have any practical tips on how people can increase that faith um, grounded in love uh, with these sort of props to put it, um, you know, in Ajahn Long Proposano's language, uh, <laughs> yeah, props, right. the props are important. And so yeah. how, how are the stat, how would you recommend people approach a place of devotion and building one? So what, what, you know, to think about what you love. So what is it that you love about the Buddha? If you're looking for a Buddha image, let's start with the Buddha. What qualities of the Buddha do you, would you say you really love? And then when you're looking at images, which image captures that? Hmm. So when I'm going to, don't just go to a stop and a store and don't just go to Kmart and get a plastic Buddha for $20, right? I'm, I'm like, gosh, the, the, the oceans I would swim across to get the perfect Buddha statue, you have no idea. Um, I'm probably not the most balanced. I'm, yeah. <laughs> you don't need to take it the extreme to the extreme that I have. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> you can't see it, but there's another shrine over there, and then there's the one in my. <laughs> it's the one in the room that I actually meditate in. You can't give us a tour uh, right now, can you, Arjun? No, I won't do that. I'm not going to help myself in public to that degree. <laughs> um. <laughs> So what is it? Is it the purity? Is it the metta? Is it the wisdom? Really good Buddhist art, by the way, a really, really good Buddha statue will have a quality of purity, aloofness, and kindness hmm. all at once. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, But not everybody. So there are different types of intelligence, and I'm probably the kind of classic, what they would call the visual intelligence type. So. Hmm. And I remember talking with Ajahn Jayasaro and Ajahn Sri Ponyo, and they both admit that for the life of them, they can't visualize anything. And they're, and they're experts at language, which is interesting. So to this day, I'm turning 50 in about a week. I don't know actually where to put commas or full stops, right? I can write books, mm. but I don't know where, where you put commas and full stops. I just I put them where I feel like they should go. And my editors tell me that it's wrong. And uh, but you know but that's what editors are for, right? So <laughs> there are there are people different people have different types of minds. And uh, like Arjun Jayasari was telling me that if he's if he looks at something and he goes away, like if he looks at the color of the wall in my Dhamma hall, he might like it. But if unless he makes a mental note and calls it, that's a yellowy beige. He won't be able to remember what color it is. Hmm. But if he looks at it and goes yellowy beige, when he goes back to his kuti, he can say, yeah, that yellowy beige on the wall is quite nice. <laughs> and uh, I will, without, without having thought any words, I will remember colors and textures a long time later. And uh, he's like, yeah. So visual, you know, I, recently built a chedi in my monastery and I designed it myself. It only took two hours. I haven't studied graphic design or architecture. And I built this kuti and I, I actually laid the bricks, 108 bricks a day for three months, chanting it to be so with each brick. And uh, I did the engineering and architecture and I didn't study those things. Hmm. But, um, yeah, I can't speak Spanish and Italian and Russian like Sri Panyo. You know? hmm. We people have different types of minds, and I'm never going to be a, a Pali expert. So. Well, I can chant plenty of Pali, but you know, probably not perfectly correctly. Hmm. And uh, <laughs> I, yeah, so I think I guess it's thinking about what qualities do you love, and then trying to find an image that that will help you remember that. 
And then with regards to the bodhisattvas, if you if a person wants to do some devanusatya, if they want to broaden their repertoire of possible samatha practices, the most Theravadins can at least embrace the future enlightenment of Maitreya. Mm -hmm. And so is there a, a painting of Maitreya or a, pic, a statue of Maitreya that, that, that you resonate with? Can you put that on your shrine? And, uh, and then it's a matter of, well, what... I, you can ask yourself, I, do you love the Buddha? And if you don't, if you, if you respect him, but you're not sure if you love him yet, I, mean, I remember the first few years, I mean, one monk asked me, he kind of challenged me, probably had some, you know, as many people do, self-aversion, self-loathing issues. One monk asked me, if the, if the Buddha was next door, would you go and pay respects to him? And I'm like, no. Hmm. Now, that's very interesting. I'm a Buddhist monk, and if the Buddha was next door, I wouldn't go and pay respects to him. And then I'm like, well, why? I think it was about three punters. And it's like not feeling worthy and feeling worried that the Buddha would be ashamed of me. Because, you know, in the, in the Vinya text, some of, you know, we study every rule in the Vinya and the Buddha is like, you foolish man. It's like, oh dear. And so there's that sense of, I'd be paying respect to the Buddha and the Buddha would be looking at me and saying, you foolish man. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he can come across as kind of stern and, yeah, I, th that's interesting. I guess not many Theravadins. One of the reasons I loved White Tara was that sense of here's a being that's going to hang around as long as it takes in samsara until I get it together. Hmm. It's less judgmental, isn't it? Hmm. It appears less judgmental. It appears very patient and benevolent. And uh, <laughs> whereas like the Buddha, he's already done it and he's already left the place and he's like saying, foolish man, foolish man. I mean, obviously he didn't just say that. He said many, many wonderful things. And uh, But for a period of years, I loved the Bodhisattvas more than I loved the Buddha. And, and it probably, it's probably not the case for everybody. And it, yeah, there is that sense of they're, they're committed to sticking around to help me no, no, no matter how long it takes no matter how much of a, a bicycle accident I am. And, uh, yeah, they're going to keep sticking around until I, until I get it together. And I think it was my practice in Bodh Gaya that really made me get that the Buddha has the same metta and the same compassion as a bodhisattva. He were, obviously he was a bodhisattva before he was the Buddha. And uh, he has as much metta and compassion as the body suffers and then obviously he would relate in the most skillful way to the person before him mm -hmm. and if that was tenderness or gentleness that's the way he would have been and uh, now i love the buddha and the body suffers equally i'm happy to say <laughs> <laughs> and yeah it's just true like there is a statue of avalokiteshvara kuan yin right here right and then there's a bodhisattva image in terracotta on my wall. Mm -hmm. And then there's Lumpur Cha. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Buddha. And that's just Buddhism for me. Like Buddhism for me has Buddhas, Arahants, and Bodhisattvas. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess for other people, they don't think about the Bodhisattvas much. And uh, But it's... In terms of like, one can get depressed about the fact that Buddhism seems to be degenerating and the number of enlightened beings are less. But if you, if you allow into the picture that there are millions of beings established in enlightenment in, in the heaven realms right now, even as I'm speaking, then Buddhism isn't dying. And it's like millions of people have been established in paths and fruits and are enjoying that and are in heaven realms now on one of their final births before Nibbana. And... Beings who have predictions of Buddhahood are, are also around, many of them. Buddhism just becomes a much more, you know, the team is bigger mm -hmm. and uh, the, you've got more forces of goodness mm -hmm. that you can recollect and gladden your mind and you, you've got more people cheering for you as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I, I guess another thing I would do is like, what is it that you love? Like, is it a, is what incense do you like? What fragrance do you like? What flower do you like? Like, whatever it is that you like, that if you think about, do I love the Buddha? No, I don't love him yet. Do you respect him? Yeah, I respect him. What do you respect? You, you kind of just get get a bit clearer about it. I respect him for this. Are you grateful? If you're not grateful, we need to do some thinking there. Like, 
for a Sankhya and 100,000 eons laying the, the conditions, I'm grateful. Like if I think about it and really what the implications of that are, I can get weepy with loving gratitude in a couple of minutes if I, if I want to. Mm. And uh, so one thinks about that to the point where one is actually grateful, understanding that gratitude is a pleasant emotion to really feel grateful. And then one asks oneself, how can I express my gratitude? Mm. And then, then one can take the step of, well, what's my favorite flower? I'm going to offer my favorite flower to the Buddha once a week. Mm. What is my favorite fragrance? I'll offer this, I'll rub a little bit of this on the Buddha statue when I do my tamat chow, my morning or evening chanting, whatever it is, you can begin a kind of a devotional practice with offering the things that you do, either out of respect or gratitude or love, or hopefully all of them. I listened to Ajahn Jayasara recently speak about how Longpur Cha told him that if he really understood bowing, he would bow with tears in his eyes every time. So right. thank you for bringing all that up again, Ajahn. That too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Tanjan, it's a, uh... It's morning in our California, the West Coast, and I think we're going to eat fairly soon. But we're so grateful to have your voice, have your perspective, your experience, and which is so unique. And I think really a perspective which isn't heard, is heard too infrequently mm -hmm. in uh, American Dhamma circles and Western Dhamma circles, really bringing beauty and love and devotion and the heartfulness into practice uh, is something which I think people, um, yeah, could really use. And we're very, very um, appreciative. And yeah, hearing you talk about the, uh, the power and the necessity of gratitude really um, makes sense and rings true. And hopefully at some point we can uh, do another interview because this is obviously there's so much more that we could, could ask. So um, thank you so much. Tana John and it's my pleasure. Mm. I guess you know if people tell you you're unique or this is unusual and I, I kind of I live and breathe my life obviously so I don't <laughs> walk around feeling like I'm unique or unusual <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> but I, I do recognize that yeah when, when, uh, I suppose you know living in Thailand and Thailand is what 50 million Buddhists in Thailand mm. so you're gonna have a lot of different types of Buddhists and also other Buddhist countries are regional for me. So having spent periods of time in the sacred chedis of Sri Lanka, having, mm. having spent some time on Kuan Yin Island in China, I, mm. I've seen large numbers of beings mm. expressing deep loving devotion in various ways. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, when, when I look at that, I'm normal. And uh, mm. when you know, probably look at Western Buddhists and think they're a bit weird. <laughs> 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 Yeah, yeah. <laughs> certainly a lot of us are imbalanced. It's the, yeah. it's the water. It's the water that we swim in, isn't it? It's like, mm. like it's the water that we swim in, and we all, you know, the faith types and the devotional types, I and mean, we all need to strive for balance, don't we? Mm. So, if if my love for Buddhist art becomes obsessive and I ne neglect the formal practice as well, well, then that's not that's not a balanced practice. But if if I can help co-create Buddhist art and make a beautiful shrine that helps people feel uplifted and do my morning, afternoon, and evening meditation, well, then it's probably okay. Mm -hmm. And then when I, you know, I do these question and answer sessions, I really enjoy them because it's different to preparing a talk, right? You never know what's mm -hmm. going to be asked. And it makes you remember the things that you've learned and been taught by your teachers. And so, yes, we all, I'm also striving for balance. I think you provide an important counterbalance to a lot of the secular dryness over here that you encounter. And um, thank you, Ajahn, and for exactly. lifting that to us. So yeah, we need bigger Buddha statues, I think. I, yes, so. <laughs> we'll work up to one like you have, Tanajan. Yeah, yeah. You, you should see the one I've just put in our new sala for the eating hall. Mm. This is one meter and 30, the new one's two meters and 80. So. That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> we have to Lovely go to on. spend time with you. I, I want you to go and eat your meal, please. Uh, bon appetit. Thank you so much, Donna John.